I joined the Egyptian Revolutionary Socialists in 1998. I was in my third year at the time uh, as an undergraduate student. And I was part of the generation that basically rebuilt the left on the campuses um, after it, the left complete demise in 1990, 1991 uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, the history of Egyptian communism is usually divided into waves because literally it used to come as a wave, you know, reaches its peak, then collapses, and then you stay for like a decade, you know, with no uh, revolutionary activities whatsoever, and then you start to get a new wave, and usually there is no continuity between the waves. So by 1990, that's when you had um, uh, the demise of the third Egyptian communist wave. And it is my generation that basically launched the fourth uh, communist wave in Egypt. Um, I joined in 1998 uh, as a student. And the first time I was assaulted on campus um, while I was uh, organizing, was not by the security services. It was actually by the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, a year later, uh, our entire uh, uh, student committee at Ain Shams University, which is the second largest university in Cairo, they all got detained after they were like beaten up with belts by the Muslim Brotherhood activists. Um, and the Muslim Brotherhood activists basically just handed them over to the police and they all like, got detained for like 15 days or so. Um, whenever we set up any stools on the campuses at that time, at that period, we used to be concerned and worried about two things. I mean, security and what the Islamists on campus would do. Uh, this is something that we always had to be very... Uh, um, concerned about. So as you can see, I mean, the, the relations between the left and the Islamists in Egypt um, haven't been really that good, I mean, to put it in a polite way. Uh, across decades, um, Egyptian leftists and Islamists have clashed uh, on campuses and outside. Uh, you can go back to the second communist wave in the 1940s. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood at the time, they used to break strikes. Um, they used to attack leftist students, communist students on the campuses. Uh, in 1946, Egypt witnessed the biggest strike wave in its history, but definitely not as big as the one that we saw later in 2006 that led to the 2011 uprising. And at the time, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, cadres were breaking strikes. And Hassan al-Banna, who was like the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood at the time, um, used to issue fatwas uh, against the strikes at the time. Um, and this earned the, the Muslim Brotherhood the title fascists. Uh, from the Egyptian leftists at the time. And it is a label that would continue with us uh, till today. Uh, in the 1970s, with the Islamic revival, at the beginning of the 1970s, when Sadat basically was trying to use the Islamists in order to crush the left on the campuses, uh, Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist students, they used to attack communists on the campuses using knives, using... Uh, um, uh, arm chains, and, and there, there used to be some really bloody fights uh, on the campuses. And such fights continued later, I mean, all throughout till the 1990s, which is my generation, and we saw our glimpse of such violence, but, you know, definitely on a lesser scale than that of the 1970s. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood also, they used to, on occasions, excommunicate uh, communists, um, smear them in the press as infidels, as um, uh, un-Islamic. Uh, they used to call for censoring, you know, I mean, books on occasions and what have you. The leftists, on the other side, I mean, they didn't really think highly of Islamists throughout history. 
um, again in the 1940s, they, they decided that the Islamists were fascists. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, the communists allied themselves in a popular front with the Nasser regime, um, at, which persecuted the Muslim Brotherhood. And you know, the communists actually, they cheered such persecution because it was a war on fascism. Um, in the 1970s, on occasions, the left stood with uh, the state at least in the end of the 1970s, when the Islamist wave was at its peak, in its fight against uh, the takfiris, I mean, which was like a radical fringe of the Islamist movement. Um, in the 1980s, there was hardly any coordination between uh, the leftists and the Islamists in the professional syndicates in Egypt. Uh, in Egypt, you have two tiers of unions. I mean, there are the blue-collar unions, we call them trade unions, but they are hardly independent. They are completely under the control of the state. Um, and you have the professional syndicates. The professional syndicates are the unions that organizes middle-class professions, like journalists like myself, uh, pharmacists, uh, doctors, uh, engineers and all of these lawyers. And historically, the professional syndicates, there was much more room for political action. Because comrades, in, under any authoritarian or military dictatorship, there are always rules of a game. There is always give and take. It's, it's never like repression all the way till the end. They always leave a margin, and this margin would be, according to understandings, the opposition would mobilized, but with a certain ceiling the, that they wouldn't exceed. And in exchange, the regime would turn blind eye to their activities. There was always give and take. So in that authoritarian formula that we had, the professional syndicates was semi-independent, um, but not the trade unions. So there was hardly any coordination between the forces. And on occasions, I mean, I did witness, I mean, clashes in the syndicates uh, in the 1980s and in the 1990s. Um, you fast forward in time uh, with the military coup that happened in Egypt in 2013. Um, and you had the rise of Abdel Fattah Sisi, who is like our current president. And back, back then, he was the Minister of Defense who organized the military coup, Sisi unleashed a bloodbath after 2013, including literally the biggest massacre in the history of modern Egypt, when on the 14th of August, the military and um, the police forces, they massacred at least 817 protesters in one day, according to Human Rights Watch. But you know the numbers are definitely uh, much higher than that. And some estimates go up to 2,000 uh, people were killed. And these massacres that happened after the coup in 2013, they were cheered by the Egyptian leftists. Actually, all, virtually all of the leftist organizations in Egypt, except for mine, they all signed a statement one week before the Rabaa massacre that was titled Ayn al Fadd, where is the suspension? Where these leftist parties were accusing the post coup government of being a government of trembling hands, which is an anecdote in Arabic for hesitation. And they were labeling the government as uh, hesitant, as hypocrite. You promised us to suspend the Rabah and the Nada sit ins. Where is the suspension? Why are these. Uh, Islamo-fascists uh, uh, are left to protest in Rabah and Nahda. And when the massacres happened, you know, I mean, the Egyptian Communist Party and all the other leftists were basically applauding uh, uh, the massacre. Now, and I mean, the reason is simple. They regard the Islamists as fascists. So if they are fascists, you know, it's, it's, it's game on. You know, I mean, whatever you do to them. I mean, if you know that there are new Nazis, you know, who are staging a sit-in here, you know, I wouldn't be against nuking them, you know. <laughs> Excuse me, you know. So, I mean, they regarded the Islamists as fascists. So it's a war against fascism. Um, so 
I guess here we need to take like a step back and, and first like, you know, look into whether Islamists are fascists or not. And I will speak a little bit about my own personal experience or to be more accurate, the experience of my uh, organization in Egypt, which had taken a relatively, uh, not rel radically actually different stand towards Islamism that's different from the historical communist uh, uh, position. Uh, what is fascism? I mean, you here in the Netherlands, I mean, you've been under uh, the occupation, you know, of the Nazis, and now you have the fascists on the rise, so I probably don't need to explain to you what fascism is. But classically, the fascists are a middle class uh, movement, essentially, or a petty bourgeois uh, uh, movement that basically arise during times of economic crises, during times of heightened class struggle on occasions, but it's a class struggle that does not settle uh, uh, the battle at any time soon. Meaning, when you are middle class, you're cramped up. You're, you know, you're cramped, you're sandwiched between the elites and between the working class. You want to join the elites as a middle class person, but so that, you know, on occasions when the working class struggle is like, you know, getting up high, the working class can actually attract you to join the ranks. But when this polarization and this class struggle continues for a long time without any, any like, you know, light at the end of the tunnel or any hope that it will get, uh, it will get settled anytime soon, the middle class, they go insane because they want stability. And they feel like, you know, completely insecure, freaked out, and they want something to be settled right away. And that's when they unleash their anger against the working class and working class organizations and left-wing organizations. That's the classic definition of it. Of course, you know, from time to another, the, the scope of their, uh, um, um, their enemies, you know, I mean, they go extend beyond the working class to immigrants, to, you know, people of color, to people who uh, uh, are not conforming to uh, the mainstream gender classifications. As, as you also know from your own history, since, again, you were under the occupation of the Nazis uh, for some time. The Islamists are different. The Islamists, even when they share um, many conservative and reactionary ideas um, that you would sometimes, you know, I mean, find in fascism, they are not fascists. And this does not mean that they are progressive. This does not mean that, you know, they, they, they can be a vehicle towards the kind of change and society that we want to uh, see. But there is difference between them and fascism. And as leftists, as revolutionaries, as socialists, you have to understand the nature of the different movements in order to be able to strategize. <clears throat> How are you going to deal with them? If you regard them as fascists, you'll be uploading, you know, I mean, their massacre, full stop. I mean, if the Islamists are fascists, I would be for the Rabah and the Nahba massacres. And I wouldn't have any qualms about that. This is not about like ethics or morals or any of these moral stands. If you regard people as Nazis or fascists, that's the biggest threat to humanity, period. Now, we have to go back a little bit to, to discuss or to understand the origin of Islamism and, and, and define what is Islamism because the term seems to be very loosely uh, used to describe like a broad array of, of, of movements. Um, I mean, for the German government, even communists, when they organize the Palestine Congress, they are Islamists. But, you know, we're not definitely talking about the German case here. We're talking about like, you know, sane human beings, basically, looking at a social movement. That people use that term to describe governments, like, you know, the Islamic regime in, in Iran uh, or the Pakistani uh, regime, which, you know, is, is officially Islamist. But, you know, this term is not used to describe, for example, the Egyptian regime. Although, um, although in the Egyptian constitution, clause two says that Islam is the official uh, religion of the state, but for some reason it's not used to describe the Egyptian regime. 
Uh, Islamist is also a term that's used to, obviously, to describe like radical jihadis, uh, people like ISIS, people like uh, Al-Qaeda. The term is also applied to uh, another radical fringe uh, in the Islamist movement called the takfiris. Tak takfir means ex excommunicate, and it's, be it's basically people who excommunicate society. They think it's an infidel society, and they advocate their separation from that society. It could be, you know, just mental separation. It could be intellectual separation, or in some radical extreme cases, they advocate the complete physical withdrawal from society and migration to the desert to establish their own communes uh, that are supposedly purely uh, Islamic. Uh, and we did have in Egypt that group at some point called the Takfir wal Hijra. Um, and in a very ironic and Orwellian sense, you can find parallels between that and the hippies movement in the US, you know, who also advocated the withdrawal from society in order to have their communes somewhere, you know, I mean, in the forest. So in that regard, it's not really that unique. Um, the term is also used to describe uh, the Salafis. And the word Salafi here, by the way, it's very, very, very loose, uh, meaning under Salafis, it could be Salafi jihadis, um, armed jihadis. And there are Salafis who basically, like, uh, the Tablighan and Da'wah group in Egypt and across the Arab world, which advocate peaceful preaching. And at the same time, they, they advocate loyalty to the ruler, no matter what, what, who, whoever this ruler is, because they think that having a rebellion against a Muslim ruler, no matter how religious he is, would be bad for the Muslim ummah at the end of the day. And these guys, needless to say, are like the biggest security informers in Egypt. They all work for the police. Um, then you have like other also strains in that Salafi movement, um, which you know it, it will take me hours in order to dissect uh, for you. And last but not least, the term is also used to describe movements like the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood, it's, it's the mainstream Islamist organizations. And this is what I will focus on in my uh, talk today, since the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood could arguably and rightly describe as the mother organization of modern uh, uh, political Islam. And I will talk about how did we relate to them on different uh, uh, occasions. Uh, political Islam could be uh, traced back. Uh, I mean, I know that Islamists tend to trace back, you know, the, the lineage to like 400 years, uh, 1400 years ago to the Prophet. Uh, and, you know, they always cite historical incidents and battles, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, they are not also that unique in that regards. Like, you know, any nationalist movement, any other political movements, they like to trace their lineages to, to ancient, you know, I mean, history. But the, the truth is, I mean, the fact is, usually these modern movements, uh, these movements are modern, and they were, they arose, or they, they rose under capitalism. Part of this transition from the pre-capitalist modes of production to the establishment of the modern nation state this just did not happen in a very smooth manner, uh, at least in the global south. And Trotsky talks a lot about this in his theory of the permanent revolution, about the combined and uneven development of capitalism in, in these uh, lately industrialized uh, uh, societies. So the kind of response that you get from societies, they, they vary, um, and they are very complex and complicated. Political Islam could be traced to Jamal al-Din al-Afghani uh, in the 19th uh, century. Uh, he was an Iranian scholar uh, who first advocated pan-Islamism. He, he came to Egypt, he stayed in Egypt for a while, he traveled across, you know, I mean, the Muslim world. And Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, why did he advocate for pan-Islamism? 
because of the colonial onslaught on the Muslim world at the time. Uh, Al-Afghani was so traumatized by the British and the French invasions of, of, of the Muslim countries at the time. And in response, he advocated pan-Islamism and the unity of the Muslims to face the Western colonialists. And here, you have to always keep this in mind. These are the origins of political Islam. It's anti-colonial uh, uh, origins. Uh, and this is different from like the origins of fascism, which comes out of a defeated uh, uh, revolution, seeking stability and crushing the working class. It's pan-Islamism and political Islam came out in, in a time to face the Western colonial uh, onslaught. So if Jamal al-Din al-Afghani was the uh, political Islam's Karl Marx, then its Lenin is definitely uh, would be Hassan al-Banna, who founded the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in 1928, four years after the collapse of the Islamic Caliphate in, in Turkey. And Hassan al-Banna, the kind of formula that he adopted at the time would continue and would characterize the Islamist movement up until our day. The Muslim Brotherhood that he created um, is a multi-class organization. Um, at the top, you have uh, businessmen, like conservative capitalists. You have conservative uh, land-owning elites. The bulk of the organization uh, contains uh, middle-class professionals, doctors, engineers, writers, journalists, um, uh, all of the, the teachers, they were so active among the teachers. These are all modern professions. So keep that also in mind, because when they get labeled as like, you know, some irrational medieval, you know, I mean, guys, all of these guys are like technocrats, more or less. They, are, they, they use technology in all of their daily lives. They are part of the modern society. They are not excluded uh, from it. At the bottom, they do have some support among the urban poor, among the peasantry, and among the working class. But having this pyramid-like organization of multi-class origins, on the one hand, it might give you the impression that, oh my God, you know, they are so big and so massive, which is the case. Yes, they are so big and they are so massive. But at the same time, because of this multi-class nature of the organization, they can never take a single decisive decision when it comes to any political or social cause that you can imagine. Because at every twist and turn, they cannot satisfy all the classes in the organization, so they are always prone to splits. Splits. The Muslim Brotherhood, they used to run always in elections before 2011 under the banner, Islam is the solution. But they never really tell you what does that translate into. You never knew before 2011 whether the Muslim Brotherhood was for privatization or against privatization because they seem to be giving anti-privatization statements on one day, the following day, they would be taking a completely different stand towards it. And then you would find like that they are trying to make some compromise. We are not against privatization, but we are against the corrupt way that privatization is being conducted. That's only one example. With every onslaught of the state against them, they used to fracture and they used to retreat, and they used to turn into a preaching group, not a political group. At other times, when the state allowed them to operate, you know, they would instantly function as the Christian Democrats in Europe, as like a religious organization, but you know, at the same time, they work in the daily politics in the parliament. So at every twist and turn, they were always uh, uh, vacillating they could never take a, a, a certain position. So the position that we adopted at the time uh, in the Egyptian Revolutionary Socialists was that we are sometimes with the Islamists, but never with the state. 
whenever we work in united fronts, and that goes for the Islamists, that goes for the liberals, that goes for other leftists, that goes for the devil, we don't care, but we always keep our organizational independence. And we always keep our own propaganda and agitation independent. And we, and we never give the leadership to whoever we are uniting with. And we reserve the right to criticize our partners. So in that regards, let me give you just a couple of concrete examples. Uh, if the Islamists at Cairo University, they get banned by the security services from running in elections, we are with the Islamists against the state. If the Muslim Brotherhood gets detained and they throw them in prison and they torture them, we are with the Muslim Brotherhood against the state. If the Muslim Brotherhood, they get uh, purged from teaching jobs, we are with the Muslim Brotherhood teachers against the state. But when the Muslim Brotherhood, they make sectarian remarks about the Copts, uh, the, the, the Copts are the Orthodox Christians in Egypt, we are with the Copts against the Muslim Brotherhood. But at the same time, we don't have illusions like some secular leftists do, that you know the state is the secular progressive custodian of civil rights in Egypt because that's what the leftist Stalinists do in Egypt. They are willing to support the state's crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood because the Muslim Brotherhood are sectarian, as if our state is not sectarian, as if our state does not teach anything about our Christian history in, in, in history books, as if our state does, does not impose restrictions on the building of churches, as if there is no like glass ceiling towards Coptic officials, whether it's in the army, in the police, in the civil service, and what have you. As if there are entire faculties in Egyptian universities where Copts cannot be allowed into. This is the kind of state that we have. So while we denounce the Muslim Brotherhood and attack them, we don't ally with the state. To give you even a more complicated stand, at some point, this was, I think, in 1999, probably, um, students at, uh, I think it was at Cairo University, they, they wanted to have some cultural event, maybe a music concert or, or what have you. And the Muslim Brotherhood students at the time, they attacked, they tried to disrupt this music festival because, you know, this is immoral, un-Islamic and what have you. So we were with the students who were organizing the music festivals, like the socialist students, our comrades on campus, they were with them, fending them off against the Muslim Brotherhood. But once the police showed up and started throwing tear gas, we were fighting the police with the Muslim Brotherhood. There is no contradiction, comrades. You know, life is not black and white. And if you are a revolutionary and if you are a politician, you always have to strategize. But just you have to have clear compass. So on occasions, we went to the Muslim Brotherhood to organize with them against the war. But when we took the mic in those events, we didn't say it's because of the Western Crusaders and the international jury, you know, that's like, you know, I mean, attacking Iraq. We would give anti-imperialist analysis and we would denounce Hosni Mubarak's regime for allowing the US warships to go through the Suez Canal, something that the Muslim Brotherhood would not speak. You know what I mean about? Now, what's the position uh, or, or what's the whole point of this strategy at the end of the day? Do you believe that the Muslim Brotherhood base cadres could be won over or not? Fascists cannot be won over. You punch a fascist. You know, you don't go and have a dialogue with a fascist. But if you believe that there is a social movement that has its contradictions, that's not progressive, that takes reactionary stands on occasions, that takes sectarian stands on occasions, but their base cadres could be won at the end of the day, then you would work with them. I mean, you cannot ignore the elephant in the room. I mean, leftists who regarded them as fascists, you know, basically, okay, well, you know, as a leftist, you either, you will applaud the government slaughtering them as if this worked, 
and it never worked, by the way. And you turn them into martyrs, and you know they you boost actually. I mean, the ranks you boost their sense of being persecuted, and you give them a sense of cause, or you pretend that you know they don't exist, and you know organize uh, while they are you know I mean in front of you uh, day and night, or you take our position, where basically you have to interact with them. If you will be working on an industrial action related to the teachers. Half of the teachers at some point were Muslim Brotherhood. How are you going to deal with it? <clears throat> How are you going to deal with that? If you prove to them that you are the most sincere labor campaigner, if you prove to them that you are the most militant and the cleverest when it comes to strategizing, they will start getting attracted to you. I will conclude this because I've, I've taken much more uh, Time, but you know, I will conclude this with, with like one thing. Um, during the year that Mohammed Morsi uh, uh, was a president, um, the Muslim Brotherhood used to organize these like one million, uh, uh, we call them millionaires, you know, the one million person uh, 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 marches. And on okay, and that was to counter our marches. Uh, you know, the leftist coalition that we had. And in one of those uh, uh, millionaires, they called it millionate sharia, you know, that we are having a millionaire to implement sharia, okay? And here's the thing, like, you know, if you, if any of you had showed up at this millionate sharia, for example, and you speak to them, and you ask them, what's sharia for you? What, like what, okay, you know, we're all for Sharia. That's really great. What, what is Sharia for you? Sharia for Khairat Shatter, who was the millionaire, you know, and like, you know, the real head of the Muslim Brotherhood. He was a businessman. Would definitely include privatization. Would definitely include anti-union laws. Would definitely include like fair wage, you know, but, you know, workers cannot really take over, you know, I mean, the factory that would be theft. It would include all of these ideas. But if you had approached anyone who were taking part in the Midunit Sharia, those who came from the lower middle class and the urban poor and the peasantry and the workers, and ask him, you know, what is Sharia for you? He would tell you, Sharia is to get job security. Sharia that I would have decent housing. Sharia that I would not get thrown out in the streets because I don't have money to pay for my bills. Sharia is that my kids would get free good education. That's Sharia for him. So as you can see, once you start talking vague uh, uh, slogans, you know, you can keep this organization together that is multi-class. But once you're in power, once you have to take decisions, once you have to take solid positions towards this or that, that's when the whole organization comes crumbling down. During that year when Mohammed Morsi was a president, people used to make fun of him because uh, in the morning he would like take a decree, like uh, let's say like, you know, uh, removing subsidies of, of, you know, some basic commodities or raising the prices of, you know, I mean, some uh, food commodities. At night, he would reverse it. And people used to make fun of him like, you know, oh yeah, he's hesitant, he's weak and what have you. No, it's, it wasn't because he was weak. It was because he had to respond to a base. On the one hand, in the morning, he meets Khairat Shatter, he meets like, you know, the rest of the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they have to take decisions because they are running now the regime. But once they take a decision, their power base, it, it backlashes. Because during that year when he was a president, some of the clients, like, you know, of course, our organization had labor lawyers, you know, to provide some legal support. And this was one of the ways that we used to interact with the working class. Many of the workers who were coming to us during that year, they were sacked Muslim Brotherhood labor activists. And they were coming to the socialists seeking help at the time. Hence, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll stop here, and I know that I've been talking mainly about Egypt, but you can always find parallels. And here in the Netherlands and in Europe, you are faced with those questions. You are faced with those questions at a time when Islamophobia is being used in order to split the ranks of the movement. 
in order to tell you that your brown Muslim brothers and sisters are reactionary and that the more of them who comes to your country, you know, the less civil liberties you're going to have because they come from like, you know, reactionary countries. And you will always be faced with these answers. Because if you are against the genocide in Palestine, you will get, of course, Islamists in the protests. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, they will definitely be there. So what do you want to do? You want to kick them out? You know what I mean, of the protest? Or you want to chant their own religious slogans to blend in? Or you take an independent position. You welcome them in the protest. But you give them your socialist literature. You welcome them in the protests, and you fight the fascists who are trying to kick them out, and at the same time, show respect, you know what I mean, to their beliefs. That's how the, you start getting, you know what I mean, their ears to listen to you. I have known throughout my life many Islamists, including Salafis, you know, who actually, they, they moved to the Marxist camp. At some point, you know, like my, or, we recruited, like, you know, the imam of one of the mosques. They, he was a revolutionary socialist at some point. So, comrades, I, I, I hope that, you know, my, my, uh, my talk with you now ha is informative, and I hope that you can reflect on your own local situation here, and I'm more than happy to take your uh, questions. Thank you. <laughs>